Hey everyone, welcome back to the Never Chain Talk Show, a Life Without Limbs production. I'm your host, Nick Vujicic. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. If you've watched other episodes this year, you know that Life Without Limbs just launched our Champions for the Broken Hearted campaign. Each month, we've been exploring a different theme from human trafficking to pro-life issues and speaking with different experts from around the world. Fostering and adoption, it's a crisis right now with the church having more than enough to actually help find a home that's maybe a temporary foster home situation or a forever home through foster and adoption. Earlier this month, we've heard from Melissa Cosby with Lifeline Children's Services. And today I have the honor of interviewing my good friend, sister in Christ, rock star Rebecca Weigel, uh, who's gotten incredible as well, husband Joshua Weigel. Unfortunately, he's not here with us, but we are so honored, Rebecca, to welcome you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for having me. It's really, I know you've had a heart for this issue for a really, really long time. So it's really good to be here and it's National Foster Care Awareness Month. So it's perfect timing. It is perfect timing. I want to say thank you so much. First of all, as uh, a family unit here uh, in deep East Texas, who uh, have actually brought your whole family from California to deep East Texas. We'll talk about why a little bit more later on in the show. Um, but Rebecca, I, I thank God for you. You are one of the first people to say, Nick, the church could really use your voice mm -hmm. for these kids who don't have uh, a, a placement right now, who are uh, praying and waiting and only, only dreaming about finding love in, in a loving home in America. I want to say thank you so much um, for, for inspiring me, for challenging me. Uh, to find uh, what God has uh, for Life Without Limbs ministry. So uh, you're awesome. God bless you. And I can't wait to get into this interview with you. But I want to first start off with the passion that Josh, Joshua and you first have in filmmaking. Uh, I want to first start there, how we actually met. Uh, and and you and, and the production that you have going on in Nacogdoches um, film, uh, you guys produced this incredible short film and I was so honored to be a part of it, the Butterfly Circus back in 2009. It was not your first short film, but it was one that did make a massive splash. 32 Film Festival Awards, Clint Eastwood's first short film award ever given. Um, what a privilege it was to see myself, Eduardo Verastegui and everyone on set meeting John and Esther Phelps as well. All these beautiful people who wanted to see a unique film that had a message of redemption like the world's never seen before. Thank you for allowing me to come on The Butterfly Circus. Tell us a little bit about The Butterfly Circus and your calling into the production world to be a light. Well, thank you for trusting us and I'll never forget being in your garage and trying to convince you <laughs> to come on board and, and trust us and um, and really just being led by the Holy Spirit because I know it was a risk for you and, you know, but you did it and wow, we did it and it's really impacted a lot of people around the world, so I'm really grateful. Um, but yeah, you know, we moved to Hollywood about 23 years ago, so we were living in Los Angeles and I actually originally was called to care for kids and families. Like my, I don't know if you know that, but my background was in psychology and I ended up getting a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. And so I was Josh's big cheerleader. I believed in him. I, I knew that God had called him to make films, but I was kind of over here. I was going to be the stable one. And like, <laughs> I don't really like Hollywood a whole lot. So, um, but God called me to work with Josh on the butterfly circus and to write and um, and God just kissed it, you know, he really blessed it. He brought together, you know, like such an incredible team of people that just really came together for the same heart and the same purpose to change lives and to make a film that would impact people. And, um, and it did. And, and so that kind of began our journey, like in filmmaking and, and it's been a long journey. It's been a hard journey <laughs> at times, mm. but, um, mm. it's been good. It's been such an honor to see 
you uh, sacrificing and being obedient unto God, you and Josh, uh, in, in difficult times. We know how Hollywood can be. And when God's called you to do something, I just want to say, uh, watching from the sidelines, cheering you on and making um, godly, wise choices along the way, uh, it's just been an honor to watch you spread your wings uh, into now as well, even on the, th on the thread of uh, foster care mm -hmm. um, through the church, mm -hmm. through film. Mm -hmm. um, tell us, and those who don't know, how, how did... <laughs> How did that happen? And right, and now California to Deep East Texas. Let's talk yeah. about Possum Trot because I'm very, very excited about this piece that you, you guys are, are doing right now. It's been years in the making, but God opened it up. And, mm. and I, you know, I told all my friends, hey, we're going to Texas, <laughs> y'all. And then I'm looking at Instagram and you're like, we're going to Nacogdoches. I'm like, I know where Nacogdoches is. Like, what's going on? You were one of the ones that said, come to Texas, you know, <laughs> when you were I leaving did. California. So yeah, I told everyone. Yeah. Well, you know, it was an interesting journey because with Butterfly Circus, we had always had in our heart to, like, foster and adopt kids, like, from the time we were married. But like a lot of people, we kept putting it off and thinking, like, someday we'll do that. Like, someday when we have a bigger house, someday when we have more money, someday when we've arrived, then we'll do what we feel like God had put on our hearts. And so when we made Butterfly Circus, we had to step out in faith um, a lot. I don't know if mm -hmm. you know this, but Josh had to give up his job as a production designer, which our steady income, and, you know, to direct because that was, like, his goal. And so we got, we saw God just blessing that process and just, you know, winning awards and lives being changed. And, and that was like a beautiful time. But right during that time, we also were trying to make the feature and, but God put it on our heart to start fostering kids. And it honestly would, did not feel like the right time. I was like, why now? You know, we haven't, you know, we hadn't arrived. We didn't have a film deal. You know, we're still in a small house and, and we really felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I think a lot of it was actually through Mahogany. You remember Mahogany on the Butterfly Circus? She was, yes. she played the bearded lady. So yeah. she was babysitting our kids while we were like writing the feature. And I had told her at one point, like, I really, you know, want to foster kids someday. And she looked me right in the eye and she said, I would have loved to be in a family like yours, Rebecca. Oh, wow. And she said, you know, I was in foster care as a, as a child. And I didn't know that. I had no idea. And mm -hmm. she went on to, like, tell me, like, story after story about the types of foster homes that she had lived in over the years. And she said she had been in, like, ten different homes. And every time they would move her to the next home, they would take all of her toys and all the things that they had bought with the state's money and give them to their biological children and send her to the next house with nothing. And I had heard of that happening, but to actually see like someone that I loved and I cared about tell me this story, I just started to cry and I just felt like God was saying, the time is now, you know, you can't wait until you have the perfect situation. Like you need to trust me and faith and obedience. And so it didn't feel like the right time. That was when we should have been like really focusing on, you know, networking and trying to raise funds. And instead God called us to bring into our home uh, a sibling set. Mm. So Ariana and Aiden, Aiden was two and Ariana was six when they were placed with our family. And it was, it was kind of a scary time for us because we didn't know what was going to happen with our future. And, um, but we just saw God like answer, like as we stepped out and as we did what he called us to do, he really provided for our family. So that's, that's kind of what started it. We started fostering and, and then I started realizing, like, you know, why, why aren't more people in the church doing this? Like, mm -hmm. we felt really alone. Like, there mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of other people that were fostering mm -hmm. in our church or adopting. And so they didn't really know how to support us. And so we were working on, you know, our feature projects on the side. Um, but I started just getting passionate about mobilizing churches. And yeah. I'm like, we got to get the church involved with this issue. And so I started working with churches across Los Angeles and trying to raise awareness and trying to get them involved caring for kids. And um, so that's kind of how that, that began. And that is actually how I came across the story about Possum Trot. Mm -hmm. We won't share with our viewers what the story is yet because it is inspiring. I want to leave it later on in the interview. Rebecca, um, 
your yearning for the church to be aware of the foster family needs, uh, the, the need out there for these kids to find a loving home. Mm-hmm. As God leads, share to America the need that we need to step up. And, and, and how bad is it? Like, how urgent is this call for the church to step up and answer the heart of God's call as he weeps over these children. It is urgent. I mean, when we were in Los Angeles, um, I was working with the Department of Children and Family Services, and they were calling saying, we have no, we have no space. Our yeah. emergency shelters are full. You know, our, we have no homes for the children. At one point, they were even reaching out to the churches saying, can we house children in the churches because we don't have enough placements for them. Um, And then when I got to Texas, it was the same thing. They called children without placement, and they say, we have children, you know, that don't have placement. They're putting them in, like, you know, hotels or or VRBOs, verbos. How do you say it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. The Airbnb thing. But, you know, a lot of, there's just, there's not enough homes right now. And so we have about 400,000 children in the foster care system, and there's about 100,000 that need permanency. So they Mm. need a permanent home. Mm. And they're waiting. They're waiting in the system right now. And I think the thing is, is that there's 350,000 churches in America. Mm -hmm. So we have 100,000 children that need adoption. There's 350,000 churches. So if one in every three churches, like if there was a family that stepped forward to adopt right now, we could empty the foster system. And I believe it's going to happen. I really do. And I believe that that's what God's calling the church to do right now. And and we're seeing that across the country. We're seeing a stirring in the hearts of people to care for vulnerable children. And with Roe versus Wade on the line right now and everyone talking about that, the number one thing that you hear from the other side is, well, you're not even taking care of the children right mm-hmm. now in your own backyard. Mm-hmm. How, you know, there's going to be more children. Mm-hmm. And there, w- there probably will be. Mm-hmm. So I think more than ever, the church needs to step up and to do something about it. Mm. For someone who wants to do something in their local church, but they don't feel called to be a foster family, how else could someone be engaged to um, help be the answer, to be the hands and feet of God to answer the crisis right now in the foster care system of America? I think something that people don't realize is that, you know, there's 100,000 children waiting for adoption right now. So there's families that need to adopt. But then the other children that are in the foster system, a lot of them can reunify with family. And so when we talk about the foster system, there's also a great need for families to step in to care for vulnerable children and help reunify the families. Mm. And so I believe, I mean, some of the most rewarding stories that I got to see when I was in Los Angeles was, you know, foster parents that felt this missional calling to care for vulnerable families and stepping in to the system to foster while they're praying for that family, while they're supporting that family, while they're encouraging them. And I had one foster mom that, you know, shared this beautiful story of when she first started fostering this child, she thought, you know, I'm going to adopt, I'm going to adopt this baby. And then she got to know the birth mom through, Mm. you know, different visits that they were having. And she started realizing, like, she's a young mom. She's a single mom. She's come from a broken home. She doesn't know, you know, she really needed support. She needed encouragement. She needed people in her life. And their family started praying for and encouraging her and brought her to church. And they ended up reunifying. And she said at the court hearing, like, we were weeping together when this mom got her baby back. And she was able to hand her back to this mom and say, you know, we're here for you. And even became like an aunt to the child, you know, and, and stayed in the life as a mentor. So there's, I feel like there's such a need for people to see this as a mission field, to see Mm -hmm. that these are local missionaries Mm -hmm. that are called to foster care and adoption a lot of times. And so that brings up how can people support them? Well, in churches, like if, if you aren't called to do that, you can come alongside a family that's fostered or adopted and provide a meal or provide, you know, a date night out or just come alongside the families that you know that are you know, fostering and adopting and provide that support that they need and that prayer that they need. Listen, we're talking about children in America um, to, to, to really find ultimately God. The fact that God loves them, God knew them and knew their name before the earth began. 
Um, how would they know about the love of God unless someone tells them? Um, when each church actually understands, I mean, look at, uh, I know the 350,000 church number you've heard from Rebecca. I love the 100,000 number, the 100,000 churches that represent $480 billion worth of debt for buildings, yet we can't really get it together to a point to say, okay, not everyone in our church congregation will be a foster family. Great, beautiful. Some will foster, maybe some might adopt. Rebecca, you did fostering and then adopting of those children. That's amazing. It, it, it's such a beautiful mission field, just like you've heard. Listen, it's about understanding like, maybe if, if you, you and your family, um, or you and your cell group, maybe no one in your cell group may be a foster, fostering family, but families that are engaging to come alongside those that want to, those who've shared, those who would like to, maybe they can't afford um, financially what that means to, to take an adoption on. Uh, the fostering though, it's like preparing meals. You have no idea these two or three practical things that you've heard that, that families can do today in your own backyard through your own local church. That's what we're supposed to really be doing um, as a church. Um, Rebecca, expand on as you wish on that, but Care Portal, the, the ministry, mm -hmm. um, how, how else would you like to explain to people, just as simple as this is, the, the magnification of God's glory and the necessity of it and the practicality of this, how can we engage and tell us more about the ministry at Care Portal? Yeah, I think it's just on the last thing that you said, something to note is a lot of people think adoption is expensive. It's not. Mm. You know, the government actually provides a stipend to families to foster children, pays for all their medical, all their dental, you know, supports you with, you know, if they have special needs, you get mm -hmm. special services, you get mm -hmm. OT. So you have a lot of support. And I think, you know, if we're getting that support, there's no excuse, really. Mm. I mean, it's actually like an indictment against the church that, you know, we're being paid to care yeah, for wow. the orphan. Wow. And we, we still can't find wow. homes for the children, you know, like Come I, on. so, um, but, you know, not everyone is called to foster and adopt. Yeah. We know that. And, you know, I did a lot of foster care recruitment in the churches and realized quickly that there's a small portion of people that really feel called to that. But then there's the rest of, you know, everyone else, like what are they called to do? And so, um, you know, I learned about Care Portal and really when I heard about it, that's when I started feeling like, because I had this frustration that the churches weren't doing enough. Like, why aren't the churches doing more? Like, why aren't they fostering? Why aren't they adopting? But a lot of people aren't called to foster and adopt. I mean, there I feel like more people should be doing it for sure in the churches, but there's a lot of people that can help and get involved and they're just not really sure how. And so when I heard about Care Portal, I was like, oh, this is the step in that the church really needs to really engage and really make a, a huge difference in the foster crisis. And so um, basically, you know, we were started by the Global Orphan Project. So the Global Orphan Project is the company that owns Care Portal. Care Portal is a technology platform that was designed to support churches and to help churches to connect directly to the needs in their community. Mm -hmm. And so what they saw is they, they went around the country and they were working internationally. And in a lot of the countries that we work in internationally, there's no foster care system. I mean, the church is the front line, you know, defense in, in the fight to care for the orphan and the widow. Um, but in America, they're looking at America and going, why do we have a foster crisis? I think a lot of us have thought that, like we have the resources, we have people, we have a foster system, we have an abundance of people who care, churches on every corner. How could we have a foster crisis with the richest country the world has ever seen? And they, for about a year and a half, the leaders went around the country interviewing child welfare workers, you know, church leaders saying, what's going on? And everyone said the same thing, like, it's there, we could do this, but no one's connected and no one's working together. So everyone's working in silos. Churches are working in silos. I mean, if we would come together, like the Hope Center here, I mean, all the organizations coming together and saying, we're in this for the kingdom. We're in this to like, you know, to work together and to use our resources to help serve kids and families. And so um, they, you know, 
everyone's working in silos, even nonprofits. I mean, we see nonprofits competing against each other. And, yeah. and really, the church has taken a step back and has relinquished our role, which is, you know, God has called us to care for these kids in our communities and these families. And we've given it over to the government. And we've kind of taken a step back and said, you know, they're being taken care of, you know, the nonprofits, the, you know, they're taking care of them rather than realizing this is our responsibility. And so all Care Portal does is it's a technology that allows social workers, um, anyone that's working with vulnerable children, school districts, we're working with the Dallas School District right now, CPS across the state of Texas and about uh, 28 states, they put the needs right into the portal and then it's based on the zip code of the family that's in crisis. It alerts the church within like a five mile radius of that need and they can respond directly to that need but they actually respond directly to the family so when they respond the social worker gives them the information and they go and provide tangible needs of families that are in crisis because a lot of the kids that are going into the foster care system are going in because of neglect it's the number one reason and a lot of times it's a result of poverty you have single moms that are in crisis. You have families that are struggling. They've lost their jobs. You know, maybe their car's broken down. They can't get their kids to school, for instance. And that can be considered neglect. And Child Protective Services gets involved. Wow. Well, that's where the church should be at the front line of defense Amen. going, we're going to fix your car and we're going to come alongside you and we're going to come around these families that are in crisis so their kids don't go into the foster care system. And really to make a connection because the church needs to connect with vulnerable families. And I believe with COVID, God's calling the church out of the walls, out of, you know, our comfort zone and saying, come with me. I'm in here. I'm down here. I'm down low in the trenches with these families. And that's where, I mean, I found that's where I've found him working more and more and just, um, so it's really exciting. I mean, I looked up right before we came here actually, and I saw there was two needs within a five mile radius right here of this Hope Center. Two single moms struggling, and interestingly, they both had children with special needs. And one of them was a domestic violence victim, and she's struggling. You know, and these are opportunities for the church to say, I'm going to go and serve. I'm going to go and help um, meet this need of this family. Wow. Uh, for churches to get connected with Care Portal, where do they go? And to learn more, get all those resources. They can just go to careportal.org. Um, and, you know, there's actually a map you can look and see if there's needs in your area or you can search by your zip code and see if there's a need. You can meet needs all over the country. Uh, we're also seeing that God is using this to unify the church, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. And that's a, a, a goal of ours as well, is to see churches working together where one church can say, I've got the resources. And another church is like, I'm close to the need. I'll deliver them and connect with the family. And business can actually fund needs and get involved and the money is transferred to some small little church in a low-income zip code where they're able to go and connect with the family and meet the need of that family in their community. Wow. Look, it, it's always inspiring when um, you see someone by example going and, and shining the light of Jesus uh, and, and meeting the needs. That is the gospel. Um, make sure that if you're convicted with this right now, do something about it. Um, but to even be more inspired, um, the most, to me, inspirational, small church, incredible example of what God can do in and through a local community when your church says, yes, Rebecca, Possum Trot. Let's <laughs> tell everyone about Possum Trot. Yeah, so in our journey after we made Butterfly Circus and I was explaining how you know, I started working with churches. I, I was doing a pastor's luncheon. You spoke at one of my yeah, pastor's luncheons. Yeah, <laughs> I loved it. Um, but I came across this story of this small, little, predominantly African-American church that was in the piney woods of East Texas. And this bishop and his wife like felt a call from God to start fostering children and adopting children. And then they ended up calling their whole church into this. And like, at the end of it, like 22 families adopted 77 children. Wow. And their church is less than 200 people. So Whoa. <laughs> so wait a second. So 10% of the families 
became a foster family. Yeah, I mean, I think a good wow. percentage of the church wow. stepped in together and they did it together. You know, they did it as a community. Yeah. They ended up serving and helping each other and bearing each other's burdens. And, and I saw this story and I thought, well, that's what needs to happen. Like, really, we need to see this become the culture of the church, that we're, this is who we are. This is our identity. We care for the vulnerable. We care for the orphan. Um, it's not just something like, oh, those people over there do, and they're yeah. so great. Yeah. It's like, no, that's who we all are. Like, we are, you know, commissioned by the Lord to bring hope and healing and restoration. And so... Yeah, so we love the story. I was I started working with Bishop Martin um, in Los Angeles to like get churches involved, and um, just started seeing the potential for the story to really move churches, to move their hearts, to move the hearts of the leaders, um, because I believe the church is the answer, and I think you believe the church is the answer too. I mean, you know, we yep. can reverse the foster crisis. I really yep. believe that the church can reverse the foster crisis. Um, we just have to take a step forward, and so we started writing the script. Um, didn't have any funding, just writing it. I mean, we were both working full-time jobs, so on the weekends and evenings, we're writing this story, and everything I'm learning about churches, you know, I'm writing into the story. <laughs> and so, yeah, we just got funded, actually. Congrats. So Yes. Woo! And the amazing thing is, is it was funded through kingdom donors who oh. really want to see the foster crisis reversed in America. And so it's donation-based, and all the profits are going to go back to reverse the foster crisis. And so we're going to be filming um, starting in September, and we're really, really excited about it. Congratulations. What a story. A very, very important story. I don't know a story like it that's been told in film. So I am so excited for you. So tell us, Rebecca, like for the churches that are aware of the foster need and the crisis, and they want to do something, um, and maybe they're doing something to a point, like what can we do even better as a church, as the mindset. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I tell youth pastors, start talking about um, purity. If we're talking about the unborn and abortions happening, you know, in our country, let's start with the next generation mm -hmm. and just starting to talk about that on the pulpit. I mean, not many churches are talking about fostering or adopting from the pulpit. Yes. You know, I, I, I think of how how different, differently churches can can approach this topic and really address the crisis immediately, urgently, right now with the, the, the microphone at the podiums. What can we do to, to as a church, do better uh, with the responsibility that really, I don't think we've answered the call at all mm -hmm. close to the fullness of what God wants us to do. Yeah. yeah, I think raising awareness is one of the first things that needs to happen is just really talking about it and preaching about it and making it a culture within the church that this is who we are. This is our identity. We talked about that a little bit. Um, we also, you know, we have families that are fostering babies in the churches, but a lot of times we're not willing to foster the sibling sets or mm. the older children. And so we have like 20,000 children a year aging out of the foster care system without a home and that's leading to our homeless crisis that's you know those children are vulnerable to being trafficked and uh, incarcerated all of those different things I feel like this is a root issue that if we address the root issue of this is God's heart to care for the vulnerable and when we do that it's going to affect every other area um, from human trafficking on um, Amen. I'll never forget uh, my friends out in Arizona who were the first people I first came across in 2003 um, that actually fostered and adopted and also two boys with special needs, mm. I think ADHD and bipolar. Um, and today they're thriving. They're mm. thriving. I'm talking 20 years later. One's married. Uh, with children mm -hmm. and the other one he's uh, he's going forwards in in a career I don't remember what he wanted to do now but I just saw him a couple months ago and just amazing just giving these children a chance mm -hmm. a loving home letting them understand what a path of righteousness a God-given purpose filled life looks like mm -hmm. in love and in deed um, and, and and no matter what uh, if God called you to that calling, you got to fulfill it. And I'll, I'll confess right now, me and my wife, we're challenged with 
our own plan of when we think we're going to foster or adopt and we're feeling the tug of God pulling on our heart and 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 I'm looking at you and even in this interview I'm all in with with anything that we I'm thinking why aren't all our churches using care portal I don't understand yet why we're not there and so we love what you're doing Rebecca God bless you and care portal and the ministry and and championing the cause in the foster care, especially uh, in America. We love you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me today, Nick. And thank you for raising your voice and being an advocate for these kids. They really need it. And Amen. So. Rebecca, I'm normally the one to pray us off. And I feel if you would pray for America, mm. you'd pray for these foster kids. Yes. Um, and you'd pray for the church mm. to move. Would you Would you say your prayer, please? Yes, I yeah. will. Lord, thank you so much for Nick. Lord, thank you for his heart. Thank you that we can discuss this issue today, Lord, that is on your heart. We see you moving in your church, Lord, across America and across the world to care for the vulnerable, Lord. And God, we pray for more, God. We pray for an increase, Lord, as abortion is at the forefront of the minds of people across the world right now, Lord. We ask for a movement in your church, God, a counter movement to abortion, Lord, where we step outside of the walls of the church, Lord, and we start to care for the children, Lord. And so, God, we ask that you would do it, God. God, by your hand, Lord, we ask that you would move on the hearts of the leaders. You would move on the churches, Lord, and that we would see a reversal of the foster crisis in America, Lord, and we would see orphans cared for across the world, Lord, and that you would use uh, these children, Lord, to purify and to unify your church. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for everyone who's listening right now. And, God, I ask that you would move on the hearts of those right now that are listening. And if you have called them to step in in some way, Lord, whether it's just signing up through Care Portal or it's fostering a child or supporting a foster parent, God, we ask right now that, God, you would move them to action, that you would give them courage, that you would give them the strength that they need to step out of their comfort zone and to heal your call, Lord, and obey your voice. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Amen. Amen. I love you so much, Rebecca. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me, Nick. That's <laughs> awesome. Say hi to Josh. I will. To learn more uh, about the resources and access them, uh, I encourage you right now to visit lwl.tv today. You can also donate by visiting donate.lifewithoutlimbs.org. All your donations help us to raise awareness of these cultural sensitive initiatives that really move the kingdom as we say yes to God to be His hands and feet and be that love in action. Love you so much and we'll catch you soon.